Number 51. Standing at the base of one of the cliffs of Mount Arapiles in Victoria, Australia, a hiker hears a rock break loose from a height of 105 meters. He can't see the rock right away, but then does 1.5 seconds later. How far above the hiker is the rock when he can see it? All right, so little uh, sketch here. Here's the cliff. Oh, here's the cliff. And the height of the cliff, it says, is going to be 105 meters, okay? Some rock <clears throat> is gonna break off right about here, right? It's gonna break off. And that's the sound a rock makes when it breaks. And it breaks off, and it's gonna just start um, traveling down, obviously, because gravity's pulling on it. So now there's a hiker down here on the ground. So here's the ground. And there's a hiker here. Now, I know the hiker has some height, but we're going to assume that he doesn't have any height to it, uh, any height to him, excuse me, because uh, it didn't mention that in the problem. And if I choose an arbitrary height, it's probably going to affect the answer. So we'll just assume that even though there is a little height here, that he's literally just at the ground height. Okay, probably won't even make a big difference in terms of timing anyway, it's probably a fraction of a second difference. But uh, so let's just assume he doesn't have any height. And um, now he looks up, right? So once, let's just assume once the rock reaches right here, he finally able to see it, right? So now the hiker detects the rock, okay? So he heard it. Now, I mean, we can go nuts with this problem is what was the speed of sound, right? How long did the sound take to reach him and stuff? Well, we'll just assume that the, that the sound that the rock made was instantaneously transmitted to his ear, all right? Otherwise, the problem becomes much more difficult, but not insolvable or unsolvable. Yeah, not unsolvable. Insoluble is the terms from chemistry. Unsolvable, even though they're two different things. Don't mind my rant. Anyway, okay. So, <clears throat> so he sees it, all right, 1.5 seconds later. So the time, so let's say that this, this would be considered something like T0. And now the time here would be something like T is equal to 1.50. Okay. And so what they want to find now is how far above the hiker is the rock when he can see it. Well, we know the total distance, right, from the top of the cliff to the bottom. So maybe if I can find this distance or this displacement, I can then use the total in conjunction with this to find this, right, which is really what they want. Now, I know it's really going to his head, but... Just assume he's at the bottom of the cliff, all right? So this is really what we're interested in right now, all right? And in order to do that, we have to first find uh, the displacement that the rock has fallen. So let's call this part of the problem part A. So let's write down some knowns for part A or frame A, okay? The initial velocity of the rock, it just fell off the cliff, so it's zero meters per second. The acceleration due to gravity, since this thing is in free fall, it will be negative 9.80 meters per second squared. We know the time that it took uh, for the hiker to detect it would have been 1.50 seconds. We don't know the final velocity of the rock at the end of part A. And we also don't know x, right? Which is, that's really what we're trying to find. So let's think, do we know a formula that relates initial velocity, acceleration, time, and displacement? We do, right? It's going to be equation number two. So let's write that down. So the displacement is equal to the initial velocity multiplied by time plus one half of the acceleration times time squared. Okay, so the displacement here is going to be the initial velocity, which remember it was zero. So I'm just going to, this whole thing just cancels. So that's just zero plus one half times the acceleration, right? Which was negative. Um, so, sorry, negative 9.80, and multiplied by the time, which is 1.50 squared. Okay, so now the displacement will be, just plug it into the calculator. So it's 0.5 times negative 9.8 times 1.5 squared. Okay, so this works out, and we're going to need three significant figures here. So this works out to be 11, negative 11.0, and that is in meters. Okay, now that should make sense. It should be a negative displacement. 
um, in terms of physics, right? Because the object is traveling in the negative y direction. It's starting at the top, ending here, that's negative y, okay? So that means it's going to be a negative displacement. But what I'm gonna do here when I plug it back into my picture, all right, I'm just gonna put it in as a positive number for now, uh, just because now what I'm gonna do is I'm not really doing a physics problem, I'm doing more, I mean, it's physics, but it's more math-based. This is the total distance. This is now part of the total. And what I wanna do is find the missing piece, all right? So we can think about a simple formula now that the total, I'll say the uh, total displacement, so x sub t, will be equal to x sub part a plus then x sub part b. So I'm gonna call this part, um, the, the part in gold here, part b of my problem. All right, and I'll just put that in gold here, x sub b. Okay, so the total now, um, the, the total height was 105 meters. The height of part A was 11.0. And now I can find X sub B, right? Just subtract the 11, minus 11.0. So now X sub B, right, becomes, what is that, 94? 94. And we can't put the decimal there, so it's just 94 meters. Okay, great. So now this is the part in gold. All right, so 94, so this piece here we now just found. Let me erase the question mark because it's not a question anymore. We know what it is. So the x value here is going to be 94 meters. Okay, wonderful. So now um, that is the answer to now part A, right? If we go back for part A, if we go back and we uh, identify the question, it says A. How far above the hiker is the rock when he can see it? It's 94 meters above him. That's the answer. Now the question is this. How much time does he have to move before the rock hits his head? So now this is where it's important now. So now I need to consider my frame of part B. Okay, This is the initial point of part B, and this is the final point. How do I know that? Because that's the direction, of, uh, that's the, direction the rock is traveling. It's going to go through this point before it gets to this point, okay? So let's try to define some knowns and, and uh, unknowns about this particular part. Now, so for part, not only is this frame B, but it's also for letter B of the problem. Um, do we know the initial velocity of that at the moment? No, we don't, right? We don't know what the velocity is here. Uh, we didn't calculate it before. Now remember, the important point between these two parts is going to be that the um, that the final velocity, let me put it in red, okay, the final velocity of part A will be equal to the initial velocity of part B because that's this is where the frames meet, okay? That's a very important um, a fact. It'll help us in terms of problem solving here. So we don't know the initial velocity of part B, but maybe I might be able to use um, the final velocity of part A. Maybe I have to calculate it. You see, we haven't calculated it yet, but we could probably find it. So we don't know that. We do know the acceleration of part B, right? It's negative 9.80 because it's in free fall, meters per second squared. We do know now the displacement, um, which would be now technically, once we start thinking about this, it has to be negative 94 meters because the object is traveling in the negative Y direction. Uh, we do not know the time, right? And we also do not know the final velocity. So I'm missing too many variables here. Um, I just know acceleration, I know displacement. I, I gotta find something else in order to help me solve this. Okay, now remember, we are looking for time. So if I think about it, go to your formulas, take a look now at the second equation again. What this equation tells me is that um, if I know the initial velocity, and I know the displacement, and I know the acceleration, I can simply find the time. So if you notice here, the initial is the only thing that's missing. So if I can find the initial velocity first of part B, I can then use that equation I just highlighted to finally find the time. All right, so let's do that part first. So remember, the initial velocity of part B, okay, is equal to the final velocity of part A. So actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the final velocity of part A. So I'm gonna use these 
knowns and unknowns, okay? Now I wanna solve for this, and I realize I have a whole bunch of stuff. I know the initial, I know the acceleration, I know the time, so it looks like I can use equation number one there, right? So, final velocity of part A is equal to the initial velocity of part A, plus acceleration of part A, plus the time of part A. Notice all the consistencies. So the final velocity of part A is equal to zero, right, because that's the initial velocity of part A, plus the acceleration, negative 9.80, multiplied by the time, 1.5. So let's calculate that. So negative 9.8 times 1.5. So we get negative 14.7, and three significant figures is good, negative 14.7 meters per second. Now remember that this number is also the same thing as the initial velocity of part b. Okay. Now we have enough information. Now this number here, we can take it and now plug it in. Okay. Let's now write out that, set, that formula number two now. So now this again is calculation for part b. So we have the displacement, is equal to the initial velocity times time plus one half of the acceleration multiplied by time squared. So what's the displacement of part B? Look back to the knowns and unknowns, okay? We know that it is negative 94, that's important. The initial velocity, now we just calculate. Again, signs are important here, so negative 14.7. What's the time? Well, that's what I'm solving for. So that's the variable, plus, one half, the acceleration is negative 9.80, and again, t squared. Okay, so let's just clean it up a little bit. Negative 94 will equal negative 14.7t, uh, right, minus now 4.9t uh, squared. I always like to have a positive a, just out of habit, so what I'm gonna do, if you notice it's a quadratic, so I'm gonna bring this term on over to the left-hand side, I'm gonna add it, and same thing with this term, I'm gonna bring it on over, and I'm going to add that as well. So since I'm running out of room, I'm just going to write the answer. So the value should be now uh, 4.9 t squared plus four, uh, 14, 14.7 t minus 94 equals zero. Okay, now from here to solve this, you would have to just make that a little neater, equals zero. From here, you'd have to use your quadratic equation. Here's your A value, here's your B value, here's your C value, okay? I have a program in the calculator, I'm just gonna plug it in. So let me plug in the A value of 4.9, the B value of 14.7, and the C value of negative 94. And it comes out, again, you're gonna get two answers, quadratic, so there's two solutions. So the time value, I'll write them both down, 3.13 seconds. And the other time is going to be negative 6.13 seconds. Only one of these are going to make sense. The negative time doesn't make any sense because we started at time zero. So that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So here now, this will be the time. Okay. So this is the time now for part B. Right. And now let's see if this is indeed the answer we're looking for. So it says how much time does he have to move before the rock hits his head? So remember, he just notices the rock at this point when the rock is at that height. So I use that particular height to solve for the time. And I also use the initial velocity at the point there. So it sounds good to me. We just found the answer. So he has a little over three seconds to get out of the way. One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, boom. Hopefully he moved. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Hope this helped. And uh, if it did, please remember to subscribe. Thank you.